Okay, well, we might as well go ahead and start then. Um, I know you guys, because I've been presenting to you for how many years? At least 10. Um, and I kind of know myself, I hope, by the age of 78, you hope to have some self-knowledge. Um, but I am a microbiologist, and I think that is such an advantage in being a gardener. Uh, and I didn't really even start gardening until I moved to Kansas in 1981. I had been a botanist. My father was a botanist from Harvard. So I learned Latin names before I learned common names. Um, and still prefer them, but I try to be bilingual. Um, and then my mother was a landscape designer. So I really do have unfair advantages between being a scientist, having parents who were into gardening, um, but it gives me the chance to share so much with you. And of course, the, the final point, most important, is I'm pretty sure I was a plant in my former life, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, we're all about the same age. I mean, I consider myself a peer of everyone from about 40 to 90. Um, and so many of us started with sunny gardens, right? Mm -hmm. And we planted trees and now we have shade. And so we have had to evolve along with our gardens to adapt to the change for sun, from sun to shade. Certainly for me, because I moved to a pasture and had my house moved. And so I started truly with a blank slate. Um, so how many of you have only shade? A couple of you, yeah. Yeah, um, see I'm a whacker. And so I plant trees and then cut them to the ground every March to keep them as bushes so that I will have full sun because I'm a butterfly gardener. And uh, so I've got to have sun for the butterflies. Okay. So, so uh, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, first of all, definitions of what is full sun, what is full shade, and are we talking ab about plants merely surviving or are we talking about them thriving? And then we're going to talk about why you should celebrate your shady garden and not feel sorry for yourself that you can't have a lawn. And then um, I'm going to show you slides of sources of color for a shady garden. I just to give you ideas of plants and flowers and objects that you could use in your garden. And then we'll have a chance for questions. But um, if you have a question, just shout it out, especially with a small group like this. Okay, now, so here are the definitions, and uh, this is what I've always, well, since I've been a master gardener, this is what I've used, but just for fun, last week, I googled sun versus shade and discovered that there are other opinions of how many hours, uh, but this is what I'm sticking with, but just to let you know, if you have a different system, what really matters is that you're consistent and your plants agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, mitts, full sun, minimum six hours, I always say eight hours, um, and starting at noon, you know, starting at eight in the morning and calling that part of your six to eight hours of full sun, no, start at noon because full sun means direct sun beaten down on you. I might let you start at 11 a.m., but pretty much noon all the way to Right now, the sun is out until 9.30 at my house. Uh, and so it's become indirect as it's starting to go down to the horizon. But there are plants who truly insist on full sun and plants know what they need and you can't change their minds. And I know especially beginning gardeners, um, they know what they want and they try to bend the plant's will, but no, you can't. Plants know what they need and they are going to demand it. Now, when we talk about partial sun, they say four to five hours of your direct sun beating down on your plants. And uh, especially because of our temperatures, a lot of plants will be okay with reduced sunlight because there are the other factors besides the sun that affect how the sunlight or the amount of shade um, affects your plants. And so definitely temperature. I mean, obviously the hotter it is, the more effect direct sun has on your plants. The percent humidity, 
the higher the humidity, uh, the more we all suffer, and then the wind. And at least where I am in Miami County, very exposed, um, <laughs> any wind uh, faster than about 10 miles an hour is like Satan's breath <laughs> coming from hell and sucking all of the life out of my plants. Uh, and so a lot of it too is what plants you've selected. And there are plants who just laugh at Satan and there are plants who are just very, very sensitive to wind and all their little edges get crispy. And uh, you're probably all familiar with the cold zone map. We are now zone six, but there also is a heat zone map it's used primarily by the American Horticultural mm -hmm. Society. I haven't seen it published widely like the cold zone, but we are zone seven. And what that means, there's so many plants, and I moved here from Michigan, so personal testimony. There are so many plants that do fine in our winters. It's our summers are too hot and too windy. And it's nice to know that before you spend the money on them. So then we have uh, partial shade. And so whether or not it's uh, partial sun versus partial shade, um, you and the plants decide that for your garden uh, because you're kind of on the edge. But when you get to full shade, again, plants have strong opinions of whether or not they are going to survive uh, that much shade. And then the deep shade, um, shade that only ferns and mosses and tropical plants from the Amazon can survive. Uh, but these are all things that you need to know as you're getting ready to make your plant selections. Okay. So here is like the range of plants in the different levels of light. Um, obviously our native prairie plants and any plants that their na native habitat is full sun. And that's what they're gonna want in our gardens. I mean, they don't particularly care that you've moved them to a garden, except that they're going to have more water and probably a lot more room to spread. Uh, you might not realize this, but like in our gardens, in a square foot, we probably put one plant out in a prairie. In that square foot, there's at least 25 to 50 plants all taking turns on who gets to bloom this year. Very different environment when we move them into our gardens. Um, <clears throat> again, it depends on the plant and exactly where you put them and how much light is falling for these plants that are partial sun and partial shade. And I don't know about you, I have zone envy and I'm always wanting to push the envelope. It's just knowing that that's what I'm doing because it's not gonna be the plant's fault if it dies. And of course the problem with plants is they don't have feet and so they can't move themselves uh, but people who brag about how many times they've moved a plant, to me, they're, they're bragging about their failures. You know, if plants were meant to move around the garden, they would have been born with feet. So next book. Okay, so how do you know what a plant needs? Well, you can talk to, to someone who already has it in their garden, and that can be very instructive because they're telling you about how the plant performs right here where we live. You know, most plants were tested in Connecticut or California, and then they get shipped to a nursery, and then they get purchased by you and moved to your garden, and the plant looks around and says, oh my God, I'm in Kansas. <laughs> and so, and so I'll, I'll, many times what you read in, in the catalogs and on the uh, plant labels, well, that might be true in a, in a more forgiving climate. Uh, when I went through master gardener training, every single speaker, the first thing they would, they would get up, and Lynn, I think you did it too, uh, and talk about how tough it is to garden in Kansas. And some of them talked about the soil, and some of them talked about the wind, some of them talked about the critters, some of them talked about the invasive weeds. We have a lot of challenges uh, because we're kind of because we don't have a big body of water to moderate the climate. We are kind of at the mercy of both the cold and the hot. So there's the plant label, um, which if you're buying plants from a good nursery, there's, they're gonna have a label that gives you a lot of information. 
But if you don't have a good label, and especially annuals, they tend to not say much. And half of it's in Spanish and I took French. So, but you've got your cell phone. There is no excuse for ignorance with our smartphones. You were only like two swipes away from the truth. And I feel really strongly, you should not be buying any plant unless you have either read a label or Googled it. I mean, did you marry your spouse with no information? <laughs> no. And buying a plant is starting a relationship that could even be longer than your marriages. And so you need to know something about the plant and something about the family. And so again, many sources to get that information. So the reality is that you are not going to be able to have the kind of plants that grow in full sun because all energy for a plant comes from the sun. And so I have your slides of perennials and slides of annuals, and they both feel the same way. Full sun is how you get the brilliant color and the really lush, bountiful growth. Um, so you're not gonna be able to have a lawn. You already know that if you've got tree, big trees. Um, they make suggestions and I'm gonna show you some things from books where they say, you know, this makes a good lawn, not in my opinion. Um, and then the ornamental grasses, which we love. Uh, that's part of our heritage living here on what used to be a tall grass prairie, but they need full sun. And you vegetable growers, now there are a few vegetables you can grow uh, in partial shade like lettuce, um, the leafy vegetables, but at least my taste buds, they don't have any flavor. So I don't think it's worth the effort personally. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then being a butterfly gardener, um, butterflies are cold blooded insects and all of their energy comes from the sun. They have to have the sun. So again, you're not going to be seeing um, a lot of butterflies if that's your interest, if you have all shade in your garden. Okay. So yes, you can fix that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and people get all horrified. It's like I said to you, let's go murder some babies. You know, like I'm saying, let's go cut down a tree. And even if you and I agree, yeah, that tree's got to go. Ah, there's this one un unsurmountable uh, challenge, and that is your spouse. Even if you've agreed the tree's going to go, the spouse is going to resist. Now I conquer all of that by the first year the tree is in my garden, I cut it to the ground. And so it's used to being a bush and everybody around it is used to it being a bush. Uh, part of the reason I do that is so that these are mostly host plants for butterflies. And if I didn't cut them to the ground, the caterpillars would be 40 feet in the air and I, would, I don't even have a ladder long enough to see them. So if I keep them as bushes, then I can walk right up eye level, and there are my caterpillars. But, you know, caterpillars rule in my garden. But this is one of the things I've done, and this is a view of one of my garden areas. Uh, that tree that has all of the Virginia creepers growing up, it, that is a walnut tree. All of my trees are native, so I have pin oaks, I have a huge hackberry, I have the one walnut, I have Kentucky coffee tree, they came up by themselves. They used, they, someone moved filled dirt to my property after the house was moved to it. And it turned out there were Kentucky coffee tree seeds in that filled dirt, yay. I never turned down free trees. And I also have a lot of uh, uh, red buds, again, because those seeds travel far. Uh, but all of those trees, uh, the ones I don't keep as shrubs, and that would be the native uh, cherry tree, Puna serotina, and then our native tulip tree, which is Liria denvin tulipifera, and then one of the hackberry trees. They all are kept as bushes because those are major caterpillar host plants. And if I let them go, I would have no sun in my butterfly garden. So I limb everybody that I do keep as a tree, I limb them way up. And actually I, the arborist does because first of all, you know, I'm little, and I'm really clumsy. I would not trust me with a chainsaw for a minute. And I've never owned it. Well, I did. I bought a chainsaw, but I was afraid of it. So I eventually gave it away, which was the right move. Um, so I have an arborist and I have him over at least twice a year. 
to look at all the trees, assess the trees, who needs limbing, who needs cutting, get all the dead wood out of there. You know, I take trees really seriously and I want them to look good. They are like next to your hardscaping, they are the next most permanent part of your garden. So you really want to embrace your shady garden. Um, you know, green is a color. Sometimes we forget that, but green is a color. And so be into all of the different colors of green and then start adding, uh, especially now the breeders have done so much of developing cultivars, some are hybrids, but most are cultivars uh, of our plants to make them more and more colorful, uh, especially like hostas and hookahs, all of those very colorful, and then art objects. So there's some real advantages to having a shady garden. Um, and I have personally tested this. You know, I have tours all the time. You all come out and see me. Uh, but I have like a tour next week. And the temperature is probably going to be, what, 96, 97? Well, that's in the sun. And I've tested it myself. You go into my shady garden, which I put on the west side of the house because I'm a contrarian. The sun is on the east, the sh full shade is on the west, and the temperature can be as much as 15 degrees cooler. And it's really, it's a, you, I mean, you're out in the sun and then you walk into the shade. I mean, you feel it immediately, you know, you can hear everyone say, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it also means, you know, in the shade, weeds aren't as luxuriant. And if you have a water feature, it isn't going to get algae in it. Um, and then I like to be, be imaginative. You know, of course, there are a lot of real creatures. You know, a lot of birds take refuge in the shade. They have to go out in the sun to, to catch the insects, but they get back into the shade for shelter and for hiding from predators. Uh, but there's also, you know, dear little fairies and gnomes and such in a shade garden that you would never find out in the sun. And, you know, here in the lower Midwest, there are also a lot of uh, flowers that in a more gentle climate would demand full sun. Here in Kansas, uh, I mean, absolutely, you can grow daylilies and phlox and peonies, all of these full sunflowers. They will grow very nicely, uh, even in partial shade. So, uh, so we can have bright flowers, but they're not going to be as full and luxuriant as they would be in full sun. But they're also going to last longer. And the petals are going to be brighter in partial sun or partial shade than they are in full sun. Full sun tends to kind of suck the life out of even plants that like full sun. But I find the flowers that do the best in full sun, in my experience, are yellows and oranges. And they can stand up to the sun. So solutions for that sh <laughs> shade hating turf lawn. Well, the one on the left is my solution. Um, I have no lawn. The devil has a lawn. Lenora does not have a lawn. I consider lawns fundamentally evil. There is more life in the Sahara Desert than there is in your lawn in Wyandotte County. And so I have mine. It's all ground covers. And most of them are uh, self-sowing aggressive thugs. Uh, I don't know, those of you who belong to Gardeners Connect, any of you belong to them? And, and so you got their newsletter and they had the list, all of the testimony of plants they would never buy again, never again put in their gardens because they were so invasive. And I'm proud to say I had every one of them. <laughs> yes! Yeah. I'm reading a catalog and it says this plant is an invasive, suckering, self sowing thug. And I immediately order it. Um, of course, I have 27 acres to fill. Uh, and that makes a difference. And then the other things I hate to plant. And I despise planting. I like everything else about gardening. I love to weed. But so I fill my property with ground covers that take care of themselves and then lots and lots of paths. And the paths are for a couple of purposes. One is to give a sense of direction and movement to my garden. But the other, and it was the only change I had to make when I, I'd had my garden for 15 years before I got interested in butterflies. And I already had all the host plants because they're cool 
plants and I'm noticing all these butterflies and got a book and oh, well, that's why, that's why I have giant swallowtails. I have members of the citrus family. I have the native citrus trees in my garden, but I needed paths. So I didn't have to be stomping on the ground cover to see my caterpillars. And so I built paths past every one of the host plants that I already had in my garden. Um, sedges. And Powell Gardens has a, an area where they have a demonstration garden of sedges. And so they've got the sedge with the name tag. So I took pictures of all of that. And I did some experimenting with sedges. Um, the Pennsylvania sedge is the one that people are pretty I don't know if you've heard differently, Lynn, but that's the one I hear recommended most often as a replacement for lawn. Uh, but even just looking at this, that doesn't look like lawn, you know? Um, it's clumping. And so if you mow it, instead of, you know, like the grasses we're used to that are turf grasses that spread by runners, uh, it when you mow the Pennsylvania sedge and that you have a maybe do that once a year, but it looks like a man who's had a really bad hair transplant and there's all these little nubbins sticking up. So I, I don't really think it's a good substitute for lawn. What I really like, and I really was thinking seriously of doing it, but Ken O'Dell told me he would never speak to me again if I did it, is the artificial turf. For a small area, um, and you don't buy the cheap stuff and you have it professionally installed, but it looks really good. And more and more communities in the Southwest are going to artificial turf, either leaving it natural with you know, pebbles and boulders and cactus or artificial turf. And I still might put in, because I consider my garden a demonstration garden, I still might put in some artificial turf. Um, the other, use of turf in the shade, just to mention, have, have any of you toured Rob Mortko's garden? He's the hosta guy. And he treats grass as an annual. And so he sows grass in his pads in the fall. And so then in spring, the trees haven't leafed out yet. And so when you tour his hosta garden, and he does those tours in the spring and they're looking good and they haven't been sunburnt yet, uh, you're walking on grass paths, and it's really lovely. And if you go to, uh, especially England, a lot of the gardens do not have lawns as part of the garden, but what they have are grass paths everywhere. And it's really beautiful. And so they keep the mode. Um, other than artificial turf, though, and the way Rob does it, you treating you know, grass is an annual. I haven't seen any, what I would consider successful lawns in Kansas in the shade. What about you, Lynn? Not dense shade. Yeah. Okay. So here are some, uh, if you want a grass look, and I'm really fond of the Liriope, and you can walk on it some, you know, it wouldn't want to be where the walking on it every day. Um, and the, the straight green one spreads like crazy, uh, both from runners and from its flowers. And I mean, it spreads by runners, so it does, it's not clumpy looking. Uh, and I have that in quite a few areas as a natural ground cover. It, the variegated ones don't spread, mine haven't spread at all. I have the variegated white and green and yellow and green, and I like them both a lot, but they have stayed as clumps, not moving. So when you read about them, everyone say, oh, well, those are the good guys, the ones that don't spread. And I'm like, no, you know, I'm, I'm really adverse to naked ground. To me, that's like going out in public without clothes on. Mm -hmm. I don't want my garden to be out there naked. I want every bit of earth covered. Now that's a problem since 70% of our native bees need naked ground. So I just have to figure out in, out in my reimagined prairie, I do have lots of empty spaces, but in my garden proper, it is going to be either mulched, and I'm talking three to four inches, um, or it's going to have a ground cover on it. I don't want to see dirt. And so what else do we have here? Okay, I'm going to try to say this. Econa, econa, low, low Kia. I don't know. 
I can read it and recognize it, but I, I, and I've been practicing for years. It's the Japanese forest grass and uh, it grows beautifully on the East Coast and in the Northwest. I've tried it several times and it has promptly died in the summer. It's just too hot here. Now I've been on some garden tours in Johnson County, uh, very, very shady gardens and I've seen it. Um, but, but I'm not successful with it. I don't know anybody here having success with Hikana Khalil. That's not right either, but you know what I mean. But I have had success with is the Japanese sedges. Now I did this huge study because I got a huge garden and I had all of these different you know, native sedges and they all died within eh, three to five years. I am obviously a serial killer here. But, <laughs> uh, but this absolutely fabulous Carex Maroyi, uh, he's at least 20 years old now. He's beautiful and he's about maybe 14 inches tall and sort of silvery. My cats like to sleep on him and it's okay. He can take that. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Now it, it's acting as a, as a specimen, you know, a focal point, but I highly recommend them and you can find them um, like the Plants Delight catalog. Does everyone get the Plants Delight catalog? Does no one get the Plants Delight catalog? Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna change your world. You've got to just go online, get the Plants Delight catalog. That's where I get all of my weird plants. You know, because I try to specialize in plants that when you see them, you say, oh, my God, what is that? And Plants Delight Catalog is a wonderful place. Plus, it's very cleverly written. Uh, so you're laughing as you're reading the plant descriptions. Uh, so anyway, for, for shade, for me, the Liriope and the Japanese sedges have been the most successful. Okay, so this is... True pictures. This is the same yard. And one, one side is the wife and the other side is the husband. Okay, so the one side is Roundup. You think that's the wife or the husband? That's right. I mean, I do admire and respect you men, but sometimes you're just too fond of Roundup. And so then he complains about not seeing any spring flowers. Um, the weed that's a ground cover is a native weed called Canadian clear weed. And then there's also, she also put some vinca in there, but she doesn't need to mow it at all. The Canadian clear weed uh, grows to about 12 inches tall and it's quite attractive. The leaves are shiny. I mean, isn't that a better approach than Roundup? And I do use Roundup. I, you know, I'm not one of those knee jerk haters, but only in in certain situations and never, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Okay, <laughs> so the design challenges really for uh, a shady garden is that it's pretty much uniform green. And if you have, if you rely on just the plants that are native, uh, it's gonna be hard to even have a focal point because nothing stands out. And so the way you make um, design decisions and make your shade garden more interesting is of course through the use of color. So here's kind of an outline of where we're going to be going. And this is one of my shade gardens, although the camera makes it look like there was a lot of sun, but there isn't. Um, that is a banana tree. Uh, I have Musa Bastu and they are hardy to uh, minus, well, the book says minus 25, but I have i don't even mulch mine above and beyond what I do. And I have six of them and they're 15 years old now. And they come back every year. Um, mine don't make, the grown season isn't long enough and they don't make bananas, but I have a friend who has them uh, planted around her pool area and hers grow to like 20 feet and do make bananas. But the bananas are little, little short guys and they're mealy, they're not edible. It's like the sweet potatoes, the ornamental sweet potatoes, if you've ever tried to eat those tubers, they're, they're mealy, they have no flavor. 
So here, but here's the list of all of the things that you can do to start bringing color into your garden, you know, between the plants and then the objects. Hopefully your hardscaping came first in your garden, um, but there's a lot of color to be had. So let's look at some. Uh, so how do you use color? And uh, I even have a presentation on color theory for gardeners, but we're just gonna touch it a little bit of the edges of it. But um, to have a garden that's all one color, and I do have a white garden. It's uh, a combination of leaves that are variegated and then uh, flowers, especially hydrangeas that have white flowers. Um, and it's interesting to me that um, until about 1850, uh, all of, you know, gardeners love rules because the world is so confusing when you're a gardener. And there was this rule that you should never have white flowers in your garden, that they were too abrupt, you know, too dramatic, drew too much attention away from the other flowers. And so Vita Sackville West, I just love the names of these English gardeners. Uh, she did a white garden in uh, 1930. And all of a sudden white gardens were all the range. Rage, and now we call them moon gardens. I even did a presentation for you folks on moon gardens, and those are all the white flowers. But people sometimes think that it's not okay to plant all one color in a garden. No, not at all. But you want to do it as a conscious choice. It's a design choice. It didn't just happen. What I like, of course, because I am a magpie and I need bright colors and lots of drama is to use the color wheel. It's embedded in my DNA because I went to art school after I got my degree. And you know, I had to decide between science, microbiology and art. And what I figured out is I could do both just sequentially. And right now I'm taking drawing and I'm also taking the ceramics class. You know, it's the learning never stops. Anyway, what I like are contrasting on the color wheel. So like chartreuse is opposite plum on the color wheel. And that's how you get the most impact with the color is using the opposites on the color wheel. There's the color wheel for you. And so again, examples of using um, the same color chartreuse. Uh, and so I do have areas, I mean, these are all photographs from my garden where I've used just chartreuse. So chartreuse with spirea, chartreuse with the flowers of my cool splash deer villa. And then that's a sub and substance pasta back there in chartreuse. And then using chartreuse with its opposite. So there is a uh, kiwi coleus. And then believe it or not, most people don't know, but Tratoscantia pallida, which some people call what? Purple thumb, queen's thumb. It is winter hardy in Kansas. You got to plant it in the dirt. You can't have it in the pot, but I have them that have been coming back for 10 years. And you can never have too much of that color purple in your garden. And so you plant it next to other purples. You get this very calm, subdued color palette. But if you bring some chartreuse to the party, you see what you get is that drama. Um, we call them ribbons. And so I have areas where I have long curving ribbons of the same plant. And so I do have, you know, ribbons of chartreuse. And then behind it, that's the uh, red dragon persicaria, which in the spring, the leaves are gray and burgundy. And then it sort of fades to this green, but it's still an attractive plant. And it still is a nice drama against the chartreuse. So more examples of how we talk about using color in the garden. Um, Again, the monochromatic garden, or you can do what we call a color run where you have all the different shades of one particular hue. And so uh, I do happen to like purple a lot, those of you who've seen my garden, or me, <laughs> <laughs> I seem to be wearing purple. <laughs> uh, but to have all the different shades of one hue, very attractive in a garden. Um, and even if it's a very bright hue, you know, then you're doing all of the tints uh, and all of the pastels. And then another is to take a very bright color and then have it in splotches leaving you, leading your eye. And that's a very effective way to use bright colors in your garden. So um, what the experts suggest 
And of course, in my world, you're welcome to break the rules, but it's good to know them first and know that you know consciously that you're breaking a rule. Um, and it isn't ignorance, it's intent. Uh, and so what they recommend is no more than two hues in a garden. Now I break that rule all the time, but it's, but it's, especially if you're afraid of color, you know, I'm not afraid of color. I mean, if you walk into my house, the walls are painted purple and red. I'm not subtle. Um, but for people who like a more, you know, uh, sophisticated approach to color, to have two hues, and one of them would be green, and then to do what we call that color run. And here's an example of using red as a color run. And you see every shade of red from the deep maroon to the hue of red, and then to the pastels of pink. And that's a very nice way of getting started with color if you are still discovering what colors really um, attract you and to move you. I mean, for me, it, it really, like that shirt, I could follow you home with that purple shirt. <laughs> you know, it really brings this enormous emotional connection. And uh, it turns out that purple is the color of transformation. I didn't know that when, and I didn't choose purple, purple chose me, but there's no greater transformation than to go from crawling caterpillar to winged butterfly. And so somehow a circle got completed in my garden. So here's green and green is pretty amazing. Uh, it also can be viewed as a neutral in your garden and be viewed as like the frame that all of the colors in your garden are contained, but it can be everything from teal uh, and so, uh, you know, you'll get into arguments with people, especially colorblind men, uh, you know, is this teal, is this green, is this blue? Um, everyone sees color differently. I mean, physically, we see color differently. And um, so to argue about color is really kind of foolish. You know, it isn't, it truly is in the eye of the beholder. But green can go from the blues and then straight greens, and then to the yellows, and it's all still green. And in the shade, the chartreuses of green really do stand out like stoplights. And in fact, stoplight is the name of that hookerella. And you see on here, I've got both hookeras, my lime ricky, and hookerellas, like my stoplight. Um, have any of you discovered hookerellas yet? Oh, good. Some of you have. Yes. So we don't like hookers because after about mm, three years, they heave themselves out of the ground. They lose their vigor. And unless you transplant them, and I, you know, I hated planting it in the first place. I'm not about to go planting on it again. Uh, so they die after, you know, at least a year of looking bad. Hookerellas. I have hookerellas that are 30 years old. And of course, I've never moved them, never thinned them. I don't ever thin or move anything. I hated planting it the first time. But the hookerellas are just amazing in that they, they seem to live forever. Now, the flowers are not as attractive, but that doesn't matter because I don't let any hookera or hookerella bloom because I don't want to detract from the foliage. You know, when plants go to bloom, many species of flower, plants, after they flowered, they don't look very good. You know, sort of like some women after they've had babies and they let themselves go, you know, the plants do the same thing. So silver in the shade, silver is another wonderful plant. How many of you have the Brunaria? Yes, highly recommend. I have Brunarias that are 20 and 30 years old and they, uh, they look good all the long if you keep them watered. They have beautiful little blue flowers in the early spring, they look like forget-me-nots, but I mean, that's a plant that I can really recommend. Um, lamium, dead, I think they call it dead nettle because eventually it's gonna be dead. I've never been able to keep it going. That's one that I have to go and buy and replant if I want it. Um, but it certainly is a beautiful silver that I can recommend to you. And then I have a lot of variegated foliage. Uh, in fact, I even have well, I used to have my bird feeder in this area, 
And so, you know, there would be this splash of white as the birds pooped on their way in or out. And so I decided to make that my variegated garden. And so that my <laughs> plants would already have splashes of white. And then I moved the feeder, but I like this variegated garden so much. What's interesting is I found, you know, there are people who are not as observant as we are, even gardeners. And I think all of these plants are the same species, even though their form and their texture is very different. Just because they're, they're white and green, they're not the same plant. So, you know, I try not to be judgmental, but I'm like, are you crazy? No. You know, that's five different species of plants in that bed. Okay. So dark foliage, um, dark foliage is wonderful in the full sun, but in a shade garden from a distance, dark foliage looks like you're, you're gonna fall through a hole in the ground. Uh, only if you put a bright color in front of it or behind it will you be rescued from that dark hole in your garden. Uh, I am particularly fond of the black cohosh, and I usually only try a plant once, and if it doesn't like me, we're not compatible. Uh, I, I sort of do speed dating with my plants, uh, but the black cohosh, I, I, I really wanted one. And so I, I finally have one. I got it from Vinland Valley Nursery and I've had it now five years and it's gorgeous, but it took me at least five tries to get a plant to go. I did the same thing with my purple milkweed. I finally have one. I used to buy one every year for 10 years from Ken Adell. finally have one. Uh, and so I do break my own rule of only trying once. If it's something I really, really want, I'm like you, I'm gonna keep trying. And then um, so many of our shrubs uh, do that grow in the shade, even in the shade, they have pretty amazing colors. And the one that I'm gonna highlight is the Japanese willow, the Japanese variegated willow. It stay now one trick because people say, well, mine turned back to green. Well, you cut it to the ground every other year. So you always have fresh foliage, fresh growth. But in spring, it doesn't show up very well in that photograph. I need to try again because what those look like white flowers, but in person, they're actually a pale peach and they're leaves. They're not a flower, but they look like a flower that they're that big, you know, it's leaves that look floriferous. Um, the other one, and have any of you discovered the Dervilla Cool Splash? Um, I got mine at Family Tree Nursery and I've had them now like five years. Hopefully Family Tree still is selling them because as you can see, that is a pretty sensational, believe it or not, honeysuckle. It is a, yeah, I know. <laughs> it is a bush honeysuckle. It does not spread. It's not a vine. It stays a bush and it has pink, it has um, yellow flowers for a couple months. And then this beautiful, absolutely beautiful variation. Yeah, that's the Japanese willow. Okay. And how tall does that go? Well, you control that yeah. because it would get 20 feet oh, easily. Okay. And I've seen it 20 feet in, oh. in gardens of people who don't know, because it was all green, that you have to be cutting them every other year. But see, I am a whacker. I mean, <laughs> in, in February and March, I have this big set of loppers with it's that special kind of ratcheting that it does and so i can cut through branches you know two inches in diameter so i don't have to get a chainsaw but but because i keep everything whacked you know i have lots of then they make these beautiful billowing bushes with lots and lots of smaller branches now most of my whacked uh trees like the the tulip tree and the cherry tree, they don't bloom because they bloom on old wood and I whack them every year. So they always have only new wood, but I, I don't want the flowers. And like my tulip tree, if you, if anyone here have a tulip tree? A real tulip tree, Liriodendron tulipifera. Yeah. When I moved here from Michigan, I found Kansas people calling magnolias tulip trees. I'm like, no. <laughs> but the leaves on a mature, regular tulip tree and tulip trees are the tallest tree in the eastern deciduous forest. They will grow to 90 feet. 
Um, and the leaves are going to be about like this, but on the, they call it juveniling when you cut them to the ground like that every year. And my tulip tree leaves are, I mean, truly huge, beautiful leaves and far more delicate. And so it's a win-win here because my caterpillars love these tender, huge leaves. And so, you know, everyone's happy here. Yes. The previous slide, you had the link, how did you say it, ligularia? Yes, ligularia. Uh -huh. That probably doesn't take too much water, does it? Oh, au contraire, my love. That <laughs> one, <laughs> well, the reason I ask is I work at Earl Hay Garden Center. Uh -huh. and we got six to eight plants of it. I don't think the general public knew what it was, and then it got overwatered, and now it's on the verge of being well, discarded. In my garden, in the dirt, uh, I they are the first plant to wilt if they don't have enough water. And in fact, I use them as a measure. I have them next to my uh, spice bushes and I use them a, as a measure of when those beds need to be watered. The other thing with ligularia is I don't let them bloom. They have ugly flowers. You know, they look like scraggly daisies. They're sort of, they're bright orange. So as soon as I see, um, a flower stalk coming up, I whack it off because, <laughs> and, and I want to focus on the very beautiful foliage of ligularias. They have absolutely fabulous foliage. I may see if I can rescue these from the dumpster and take a fall. <laughs> oh, you should. I, I, again, they're going to need shade. Yeah. Uh, partial shade is too much sun. You, I mean, they need shade and they need to be kept watered. Okay, so in a garden like mine, in the shade, uh, and so you've got all these this ground cover, and it can look kind of wild and messy, and so you really need to make destination paths and destinations. And in the real world, um, you probably are building paths after the fact, but in my imaginary perfect world, you would have graph paper and you would design your garden first. And you would design first the hardscaping. And the hardscaping is the outlines of the beds and the outlines of the paths, because that's what gives you the form. Of course, first what comes is function, since we're talking garden design here. What is your garden's purpose? What is it going to do? And then what shapes and forms will fulfill that function? And, and then what colors do you want? Because colors establish your mood. And then the very last thing you think about are plants and you choose plants that will fulfill the function and will outline those forms. But my garden's design is set by the hardscaping. So it doesn't matter what plants I have in there because the design is the hardscaping. And then next, the next most permanent part of your garden, of course, are the trees. Um, and so that should be the hardscaping first and then your trees and then your shrubs and then your perennials, and finally your annuals. But we could spend hours talking about garden design. But paths are what you want to use in a shade garden to give it form and to give a sense of drama and destination and movement. Um, my paths are all, in my shade garden, my paths are all uh, wood chips. There are no wood chips in the beds. No plant evolved with wood chips as its mulch. It's a, and it's a horrible material to use for mulch for plants. Plants do care. You know, pe you'll hear people say, well, it doesn't matter what you use for mulch. That is not true. Plants evolved with leaves and twigs and plant debris as their mulch. And a mature garden like mine, I don't have to buy mulch. It is self-mulching because every leaf that falls falls right under the plant that made it. And every twig falls under the plant that made it. And any leaves that are in the path, those I got gather up and I put right back into the beds that are closest to them. If you remove even a single leaf from your garden, you are removing nutrients from the system. So I have not had to fertilize my garden in what, 35, 38 years because I let the leaves fall, the plant debris fall, the little microbes in the soil eat it and feed my plants. 
It's a very, it's a very different system than because nobody's making money off my garden. You know? So it's a very different system than what you'll hear promoted, certainly by manufacturers. Um, and also by people, you know, I'm a microbiologist, so I'm, I'm in favor of microbes and fungus. Um, what's next here? So a lot of shade loving shrubs have very dramatic flowers in the summer. Um, and the same with bulbs. And I, I think that's the next slide is, you know, these are all plants that bloom before the trees leaf out. You know, trees are like great big old bullies. They leaf out and take all the sun and, and their roots down there are sucking up most of the water. But you can have wonderful, wonderful flowers in the early spring because there is enough light, enough energy for the plant to go ahead and bloom. And one to talk about in the center there, that's a Japanese caria. I've had him there for 38 years at least. Um, mine is the single, but they now come in doubles and the branches stay green all winter long. Now they do, they do make runners, but you know, I love weeding and pruning and all that sort of, so I don't mind pulling up the runners when they go into the path because you will have to do that kind of maintenance. But it's really lovely. And here's the bulbs on, on the right and, you know, perennials like the bleeding heart. They're not, they're not blooming in the middle of summer when there's no energy and there's leaves everywhere in the canopy, uh, but wonderful in the spring. Um, my experience with tulips here in Kansas is that they're, they're annuals. In Michigan, they live forever. And I do have some Darwin tulips that are probably 35 years old and come up faithfully every year. Also, the little species tulips will be true perennials, but these showy bulb type. Uh, one year I put in 1,400 bulbs in a fairly small area. And then the, the first year, I probably had about 200 plants. The rest probably were winter menu items for the voles. And <laughs> now I have faithfully coming back, and it's been 10 years, um, these watermelon colored tulips, and there's probably about 15 of them, and every year they come back faithfully. So, bowls don't like them, I don't know. But a lot of the uh, shade loving flowers, you know, we have them in the spring, and then summer they're gone. Some of them will come back in the fall, then when the colors cool, and others don't like the calendulas are true annuals, and when they're done, they're done. But I've had good luck with snapdragons. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the Madam Butterfly series. They come in a lot of different colors. They don't even look like snapdragons. Although, guess who knows that they are snapdragons? Buckeye butterflies. They are in the figwort family, and they are a host plant. Mm -hmm. Snapdragons and angelonia both are figworts, and so they are host plants for the buckeye butterfly caterpillars. Um, I love pansies, but I hate to plant. And so they're one that you're going to need to plant every spring and, and they don't really last that long. So the real answer for shade and bright color are the tropical plants who evolved in the, in the same situation that you are growing in, which is deep shade and moist. Most of these need a lot of moisture, but you really can get the kind of color that you want, similar to what you get in the sun. And so you know them already, the coleus, the impatiens, and the begonias. And so impatiens, and I love, I love its botanical name, impatiens, impatiens. Uh, and they, the breeders have done wonderful work. So they, they're in so many colors and they are doubles. Um, the next slide, I'm gonna show you some of the fancy ones. The one problem, and it's so sad, is there is now a, um, mildew that has worked its way this far west and once and and it's a fungus and there's no cure for a fungus and uh, you can still be very successful with impatiens in containers with soilless mix which is what you should use in containers anyway but you might start having problems if you have have them planted in beds anyone having the what do they call it downy mildew Am I the only one? Well, it's probably the universe punishing me for something <laughs> I've done. Okay, next one. 
<laughs> so they've gotten really fancy. And so what I'm doing now is I'm planting both in the dirt and in containers, this variegated sun patience. Um, and it also comes with solid green leaves. Uh, it's a wonderful plant, but I recommend uh, wherever you have them, whether it's in dirt or in a pot, that you have an irrigation system because boy, they, their, their predecessor was called the bounce impatience because it would lay down and then you would water it and it would bounce back up. And, but, and the sun patients do the same thing. Uh, but I think they're really worth having if you have a way of keeping them watered because boy, did they look pitiful when they flop down. Do you use them, Lynn? No, I don't have enough shade. Um, Okay. Although they will grow in sun if they have, if they're kept watered, you know it's like impatience will grow in sun. It just needs to be kept watered. Um, so let me ask my group here. This is why I like you know in person. How many of you have discovered the balsam? Oh, excellent! I am in, in a group of sophisticated, knowledgeable gardeners because <laughs> I find most people have never heard it and they heard of it and they see it in my garden and they're just a Bounded. Well, first of all, its botanical name is impatience balsamina. So it is another kind of impatience, but it's an annual, a true annual. You know, impatience, impatience is a perennial. And I have some that I've taken in and kept in my greenhouse over winter. I have an impatience plant that's three years old. It is a perennial. It's the winter that kills it, not its genes. <laughs> uh, but balsam is a true annual and it grows tall instead of making this nice spread that impatience make. But it is a true self-seeding bug. My kind of plant. Once you've had one for the rest of your life, you will have carpets of them in your garden. Um, another name for it is uh, touch me not because if you touch the seed pod, it will explode and throw seeds everywhere. Uh, it comes in four colors. And um, so this is the magenta. It also comes in a, a coral and a lavender and a beautiful pale uh, pink. Um, and they decide what color they're gonna be. I've tried saving seeds, you know, from one color and, but there's always other colors come join the party. Yeah. Where we previously lived in a duplex, we had a ravine, so we had a lot of storm water runoff, and I created a, a rain garden, and that was one of the plants that did oh. very well and just kind of self-seeded in yeah. an area where I didn't really care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just makes a carpet of color, mm -hmm. and they bloom for, what, six weeks maybe? Fairly mm -hmm. long, yeah. Uh, and then they'll rebloom, and then they start from seed really, really easily. Even I start from, from seed. And I have to be very humble about my seed starting abilities. Um, the unfortunate thing is that downy mildew does also affect them. And so the ones that I have in the ground, and you never, until it's just about to bloom, and then all of a sudden you look out and it's wilted. And so you just have to rip, out, rip them out of the ground and I put them in the burn barrel because I live in the country. What do people do who don't have burn barrels? Put it in the trash? Yeah, okay. And then of course we have begonias and it's really um, a whole bunch of different kinds of begonias that botanically are really quite different. I put Rex with a question mark because I've never grown Rexes. I don't know, do, are, they're shade, right? Lots of moisture, I'm just guessing. I've killed the few I've tried. So again, serial killer. Um, but I use the Dragon Wing series a lot and they like full sun. And also the wax begonias are very flexible. They can do everything from full sun to really shade, even darker than, than partial shade. Um, the angel wings are a little more sensitive. They do definitely want shade, but I have uh, angel wings that are like 20 years old, the individual plant. I have them in pots take them into the greenhouse for the winter. And when I talk about greenhouse, what I'm talking about is uh, 48 feet of fluorescent lights in the ceiling of my basement. I mean, that it's not a real greenhouse, but, uh, and it's not enough to like grow zinnias or anything like that, but it's enough to keep all of my tropicals over the winter. Uh, I have not had good shade, 
luck with the tuberous begonias. Uh, one year I bought one and it lived. And so the next year I bought like 20 of them because, oh, they are so gorgeous. And they all immediately died. So we're just not compatible. I just, you know, I don't take it personally. We're just not compatible. But if any of you are having luck with them. I am uh, on a north facing garage. Oh. I've got them in pots and nice. Oh, that's nice. See, where I am, I'm so exposed that even my shade garden has a lot of wind in it. And then the other problem is I'm watering from my lake and the pH of my lake is not, I mean, it's almost like Clorox. It's so alkaline because it's lined with limestone rocks and they're constantly creating the alkaline conditions. Now, I can't grow water lilies because it's too alkaline. So, and so I think a lot of my failures, again, I refuse to take them personally, but it, you know, it's the conditions that I'm growing plants in I can't change the plant's mind. If they don't like alkaline water, then we're just not going to be able to do it. Okay, yes, there is a perennial begonia. It's in my garden. They have it also at Kaufman Gardens, and uh, it's begonia grandis, and they spread, but, but nicely. It's not obnoxious. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a thug. And they bloom in September with these beautiful pink flowers. So they're, they're another one of the plants that when people see it, they're like, oh my God, what's that? And um, lovely plant. That one you'd probably have to get mail order. I don't know if you'd find it in the nursery. But you see, it's so many of my plants I buy from catalogs and I've always had good experience with catalog plants. And so I do my shopping with, you know, a glass of wine and my list and I start, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And it can take me as long as three years. I've, I've got this spot where I need a plant. It can take me as long as three years of studying and reading and deciding what plant goes in that spot. You know, I don't run to the nursery and buy a plant, take it home, and then look, now what do I do? Where do I put it now? Um, here's some other examples that I have experience with. Um, the red lobelia just hates me, and I've never had good luck with uh, the wild blue lobelias uh, I do have success with. Well, they were growing around my lake when I bought the property. I certainly would not have luck with them. A friend gave me probably 200 lobelias and they did not survive to ev even to the fall. Yeah, Again, let's blame my alkaline water. Uh, the trictus, the toad lily, oh, and it's so gorgeous and it blooms in September. Um, but that plant really needs a lot of water besides it being in shade, not just partial, real shade, and then lots of water or its leaves all turn crispy. But even with crispy leaves, it blooms, but it looks ugly. You know, the leaves look so ugly. Uh, of all of these plants, the one I consider the most successful is Plectranthus mona lavender. It is uh, a perennial, but an annual in our climate. It, doesn't bloom this floriferously during the summer, but as soon as the temperatures cool down in the fall, you have the absolutely fabulous. And so if you remember the slide where I showed um, having a spectacular plant, you know, space leading you, that's what I use. I always buy 12 of the Plectranthus and use them to line, uh, I would say the main trunk of my path in the shade. They, and, and, you just can follow the Plectranthus. They also are very attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, most butterflies, well, yeah, the only butterfly that has a tongue long enough to drink its nectar is the cloudless sulfur, which migrates here in usually in August. Um, but the white-lined sphinx moth, if you know that, it's one of the hummingbird moths, also absolutely adores. And they're flying right now. They fl Even though they're a moth, they they start flying about nine o'clock in the morning and nectar all day in your garden. Right now, I've got three of them nectaring on my Monarda, my bee ball. Uh, and then, you know, I do mothing. So I set up the uh, mercury lights and bring moths in at night and they come to that party too. When do they sleep? I don't know. Love them. Okay. And so, of course, the hydrangea. Uh, my favorite is Hass Halo. What a Fabulous plant. It is a cultivar, a naturally occurring cultivar of our native hydrangea arborescence. And when it blooms, it's to the to the bumblebees, it's like crack. 
The bumblebees are just all over each flower. And you might not know this, but a okay, so a flower blooms, it has nectar, it's attracting all the pollinators. Once it gets fertilized, it stops making nectar. And it also stops making fragrance. And some of them even change, like lantanas, change color to let the pollinators know, don't even bother. You know, stop making fragrance, don't even bother. If they try, there's no nectar, they quickly learn. And so I, I, I again, as I look at mother nature and it's just so efficient and so smart. Um, we have our native oak leaf hydrangea, but you know, those uh, flowers turn a dark brown and ugly. And the leaves also get ugly brown spots on them. And I have them both in uh, shade because that's what the book said, but they don't really like shade. They want to be in partial sun. So I have another one that in partial sun that's four times bigger and they were planted at the same time. Um, I am trialing the Japanese uh, hydrangea and um, it hasn't bloomed yet. It's been in my garden now for two years, but I'm not getting too upset about that. I, wanna, I just, we'll see how it does. Uh, but it's supposed to be the most shade tolerant of all the hydrangeas. And then if you know Epimidium, um, rabbits know them. <laughs> so, so sometimes it's hard to get them started because of rabbits. And they really do have these absolutely darling little flowers. And they have the flat, they now, have flowers in many different colors and they are one of the few plants that really does grow in dry shade. Um, where I have them, I would say it is moist shade because it's in an area that's you know part of my shade garden and I water it and they're doing okay um, but I've seen them in other, other people's gardens where they really are kept dry and they're much happier. And that's pretty amazing and also if you look at our native plants like uh, I use Virginia creeper as a ground cover and Virginia creeper, very drought tolerant. And I think very beautiful. Sometimes because a plant is really easy to grow and especially if it's a native plants, plant people, gardeners kind of despise it because it's too easy. I mean, they want the delicate ones that you have to struggle to get them to grow. Um, and I don't feel that way. I, you know, if I see a plant that's really doing well, I'm like, yay, you go girl you know, instead of trying to corral it. So do you really need flowers? Well, um, I have areas where I can't get the hose to and they're very shady. And so I start dragging stuff out there. <laughs> and I got a lot of stuff out in my garden. Uh, so these are just some examples. And then also, if you have a small garden, you really, you know, you gotta have function with your color. And so certainly, to have like your garden furniture, uh, fencing, if you have railings along your paths, all of that can be bright colors, doesn't have to be neutrals. And of course, I have a lot of garden art in my garden. The one on the right would be mine. Um, or you might just have a few tasteful pieces. I think good taste is overrated. <laughs> 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 More is never enough. <laughs> Go ahead. And then also another way of using color is to have a signature color. Like for me, it's purple. And the perella, and any of you have perella? So you know, we're talking major thug. Um, and so what I do is it's coming up all over my garden. I weed it out to make ribbons so that it actually becomes a, a very strong focal point throughout the garden. You can follow the perella around my garden and it grows in both sun and shade. Um, same as balsam. Balsam grows in both sun and shade as long as it has enough water. Uh, the balsam will wilt if it gets too dry, but if you water it, it comes right back. And so here is the ultimate solution. You all know I have no shame <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> and so... <laughs> There are areas where I've decided I need some color, like here are my, my uh, this is my bottle brush buckeye. I should have taken a picture when it was in bloom because it, you know, it does have beautiful flowers that look like a bottle brush, but it only blooms for like, you know, maybe three weeks and it was done blooming and I, and it's at the back of my white flowered garden. So I went over to Hobby Lobby. Now you don't want to buy pure white 
or pure green, because you can tell immediately looking at them, they're fake. These are actually pale peach. So in person, they look really, you can, some of them can tell that they're not white. Um, I did have on here some, uh, they were fabric or scythias that had faded to a pale yellow. And I tied them to the bottle brush uh, Buckeye for years and had several master gardeners going absolutely crazy. What is that plant? <laughs> well, but they finally kind of disintegrated because they were fabric. So uh, I now have my plastic and you have to search long and hard to find you know, a, a plastic flower or now they have a lot of fabric silk flowers uh, that will look good and appropriate in the garden. But sometimes that's the answer. Okay, next one, we're getting to the end. There we are. Uh, this is Myrna Minnis's garden. And if, you, if any of you know Myrna, she is a garden artist. And in June, she has this huge garden art show with 10 vendors. Um, I see a lot of the Johnson County master gardeners there every year. I, have, I, don't, I need to send you the, the notice. Um, but she makes all kinds of just wonderful garden art. She does ceramic art, but she has people who make glass sculptures and fabric sculptures, and they're all for the garden. And she shows them in her garden. It's really quite wonderful. And her garden is a shade garden. So. Is she the one that got all the beautiful babies? That's Lois Hart. That was Lois. Yes. Another wonderful garden with a lot of art that Lois makes. Yeah. Yeah, our uh, master gardeners just had an advanced training with Lois. Oh my gosh, she's 800 different species of daylilies in her garden, and she knows every single one of them. And uh, she. So, do you think we could do a field trip? Oh, yes. Now, it's past daylilies. Really. Well, I know for next year. But next year, I highly recommend it. Not only could you, you should go to mm -hmm. Lois's. And she loves giving the tours. She also has hundreds of bulbs and clematis. Uh, what else does she have a lot of? You know, she has the regular lilies, not just day lilies, that bloom at the same time. Uh, it's really an experience worth having. Now, I've been there quite a few times because it's all, you know, it's like any garden, it's always different. And then she's so knowledgeable. Um, if you don't know Logies, Logies is in Boston. They're a nursery, and of course, you can get their catalog, but they sell a lot of these tropical plants that I've been recommending. Um, wonderful catalog. Let's see it. And you all probably know all of the, the Flower Farm and Vinland Valley Nursery are the two nurseries that I use. And Vinland Valley, if you don't know, I don't mind sharing. Vinland Valley Nursery is the vendor for our plant sale. Yeah. It's so embarrassing. You know, we're just not able, even though we're master gardeners, to grow plants that look commercial enough that you can sell them. <laughs> you know, to grow flats and flats and flats of plants for we sale. We bought our annual for the flower farm this year. Oh, good. And we were very pleased. Good. Very yeah. And, and obviously, they're so close to me, I'm there frequently. Yeah. So, um, any questions or comments? You know, I don't have trouble with deer in my, up in my ornamental gardens or my shade gardens. Um, I stopped doing vegetable gardening because of deer. Uh, but I, you know, she's asking which shade plants are most deer resistant. I'd have to ask other people because the deer don't come into my shade garden. Any suggestions? There are lists that you can get online as mm -hmm. well. Just mm -hmm. make sure you check out the .edu sites. Those will be educational sites, not people selling you things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you need. I'm but you know, a hungry deer eventually will eat just about anything. Well, thank you, Lenora. It's always a pleasure mm -hmm. to have thank you. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.